In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was a scene of utter pandemonium on that road leading into Jerusalem. Throngs of dusty, sweaty men and women were pushing, shoving, jostling for position, and craning their necks to see. Little children were climbing high into the trees and being lifted up to break off the palm fronds and throw them down to the anxious crowds below. Cloaks, coats, and tunics were being torn off and thrown into the roadway in anticipation of the honored guest. Hymns, psalms, and shouts of Hosanna in the highest were ringing down from the heights of the Mount of Olives and echoing back again like a great ocean wave from the Kidron Valley floor. Chaos and confusion seemed to be the order of the day. Chaos, confusion, and unbridled excitement. Suddenly he appeared, the focus of all this energy and excitement, a solitary rider silhouetted against the sky, mounted on a lowly donkey, gingerly picking his way through this great mass of humanity, the shouts, the cries of the people ringing in his ears. Nobody who was present on that day would ever forget the sight. For it was the deliverer, it was the Messiah who was finally drawing nigh. And as he did, the curtain began to rise on this, the greatest drama of all time. Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday marks the beginning of the most momentous week in all of history. As I'm sure most of you are aware, Jesus lived on this planet for 33 years, and he was engaged in active ministry for three of those years. And yet what's fascinating is that all four of the Gospels make it very clear, it's actually the events of this last week, the week that begins with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem that is the real heart and focus of his life and ministry. Just consider the following. Matthew, the first of the Gospels in the New Testament, tells the whole story of Jesus' life, all 33 years, from the moment of the Lord's birth in Bethlehem right up to the time of his ascension. And yet one quarter of the Gospel of Matthew, eight full chapters, is given over to a description of just this last week. And Matthew's not alone. Mark does something very similar. In fact, Mark does something even more impressive. Mark devotes one-third of his gospel narrative to a description of just these last seven or eight days. Luke devotes one-fifth of his account, and most impressive of all, John, the fourth evangelist, devotes one-half of his gospel narrative to a description of this brief period of time, these last seven or eight days. Now, you think about that for a moment. There are 89 chapters in total in the Gospels, and yet one-third, 29 and a half, are dedicated to a description of just this last week. Any way you look at it, that is extraordinary, and it's meant to tell us something. It's meant to tell us something very important, that it's actually the events of this last week, the events that take place between Palm Sunday and Easter Monday that are the truly important events. They are the most important events in Jesus' life and ministry, and by consequence, they really are the most important events in the history of the world. It's fair to say that everything else in the Gospels up to this point is mere prologue by comparison. And so long as a person understands the significance of the events of this week, they really understand the heart of the Christian gospel. So my friends, as we begin our journey through Holy Week, I want you to understand we are beginning to tread on some very sacred ground. Now, as I said, Palm Sunday, or the Lord's arrival in Jerusalem, was the event that signaled the beginning of this most momentous week. But we shouldn't think that that is the only significance of Palm Sunday, that it is the trigger 
that it is the impetus for all of the really important events that follow. Actually, it is an event that has great significance in its own right. Truth be known, Palm Sunday is the event that sets the stage for everything else that follows. And as such, it teaches us a number of very important lessons that we have to keep in the forefront of our minds as we make our journey toward the cross and the empty tomb. And the first of those lessons has to do with Jesus' true identity. It is Palm Sunday where we see Jesus making the greatest claim for himself. As we've just seen, there was a tremendous amount of excitement and energy as Jesus drew near to the city. People were shouting, cheering, pulling down the palm branches from the trees. The scripture said the people could hardly be restrained. But you know, it's worth pausing and asking the question, why was that? I mean, why was it that the people were so ecstatic on this particular occasion as Jesus drew near to Jerusalem? Oh, it's true, huge crowds had followed the Lord in the past, especially up there in Galilee where he started his ministry. You'll remember the feeding of the multitude. That time there were crowds in excess of 5,000 people following Jesus. But the scriptures are very clear. By this point in his ministry, as Jesus was approaching Jerusalem, those crowds had for the most part dissipated. Those heady days of popularity were now in the past. Oh, sure, the people loved Jesus' signs and wonders, but they didn't particularly care for the preaching and the teaching that followed. <laughs> they didn't particularly care for the things that Jesus had to say about them, or for that matter, the things that he had to say about himself. For instance, in John's gospel, Jesus declared himself to be the bread of life. He said, I am the true bread which comes down from heaven. Whoever believes in me shall never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And the scripture says that when the people heard this, they grumbled. They turned to each other and they said, this is a hard saying. Who can accept it? And when they said hard, they did not mean this is hard for us to understand. They meant this is hard for us to receive. They didn't like it. And that portion of scripture ends on a very somber note with these words. And from that point, many of his disciples turned back and followed him no more. So by this point, those crowds that had followed Jesus, they are gone it's fair to say there were probably only a handful of people, maybe a couple dozen loyal followers who were with Jesus as he came to the close of his work. And yet we find in today's gospel lesson that lo and behold, all of a sudden, on Palm Sunday, the crowds are back. They are back, and they are back in droves, and what's more, they are hailing Jesus as a conquering hero. What accounts for that change of heart? What accounts for that change of mind? Well, the scriptures tell us there were two things in particular. The first was the raising of Lazarus from the dead. You'll recall this was the greatest of Jesus' miracles. Lazarus had died. He'd been in the tomb, his body, for four days. In fact, his body had started to decompose. And Jesus came to the mouth of the tomb, and he called the dead man out. And we're told that, lo and behold, Lazarus came forth. And he came forth in the presence of many witnesses. Bethany, the town where this took place, was only two miles outside of Jerusalem. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus came from a prominent family. And we are told that a great number of Jews from the city had gone out to comfort the sisters in the loss of their brother. So when Jesus performed this miracle, this was not something that was done in a corner. This was not something that was done in the dark. Jesus performed this miracle. Many people witnessed it, including many people of high status. And because of the close proximity, as you can well imagine, it took no time whatsoever for the news of this enormous feat to make its way back to the city of Jerusalem, where the scriptures tell us it caused no little stir among the population. It caused no little stir among the population, and it caused a great deal of alarm 
among the Jewish religious leaders. And in fact, the scribes and the Pharisees were heard to complain, what are we going to do now? We are gaining nothing. The whole world is going after him. So when we ask the question, why were the crowds back? Certainly that was one reason. It's because Jesus had just performed this great miracle in the presence of many witnesses and just a few days before he went to Jerusalem. But there was another reason for all of this enthusiasm. It's because having performed this miracle and having stirred up the crowds, Jesus now set his face toward Jerusalem. And he decided to enter that city in a very dramatic way on the back of a donkey. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what is so extraordinary about that? After all, this was the first century. They didn't have automobiles in those days. They didn't have public transportation. Nobody had bicycles even. People rode animals. Well, it's worth noting, this is the only place in all the Gospels where we find Jesus riding an animal. Animals were expensive in the ancient world to maintain, and most poor people couldn't afford them. Most poor people, if they were traveling, traveled from place to place on foot. And all the references say that that's how Jesus and his disciples traveled. Except this time. On this particular occasion, Jesus chose to ride a donkey. And it was because he was sending a message to the people. He was performing a symbolic act. What was he doing? Well, the Gospels of Luke and John tell us he was fulfilling prophecy. You see, there was an Old Testament passage from the book of Zechariah that stated that when the king came, when the Messiah arrived, he would come in lowliness, in meekness, mounted on the back of a donkey. Here's how the text re reads. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. For behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Let me tell you, when Jesus decided to enter Jerusalem, on that day, in that way, nobody missed the point. Everybody understood what was happening. This man who raised people from the dead, this man who exercised dominion over the power of the grave, had now set his face toward Jerusalem, and he was coming, presenting himself, as the Old Testament had prophesied, as the Messiah. And that's why the people went crazy. That's why they were shouting and cheering and tearing down the palm branches. That's why they were crying till they were hoarse, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That word means save us, save us now. It's because they understood that the Messiah, the Savior, the one who claimed to be the Messiah, the Savior, was drawing nigh. Now we all know that over the course of the next few days, the attitude is going to change dramatically. We all know that those shouts of Hosanna are going to give way to shrieks of crucify him, crucify him. And all because Jesus didn't measure up to the expectations of the people as to what they thought the Messiah ought to be, namely a military or political Messiah. But the claim was unambiguous. Whatever confusion there had been up to this point, there was no confusion anymore. Jesus was riding into Jerusalem claiming to be the king of the nation, claiming to be the only Messiah, the only Savior. Earlier in his ministry, Jesus had asked the disciples a question. He said, what do you think of the Christ? The King James Version says, what think ye of Christ? Well, Jesus was now presenting that question to the whole population of Jerusalem. He was saying, here I am. Here I am. I am the king. I am the Messiah. What do you think of me? I want you to understand that is precisely the same question that Jesus puts before us this morning. 
The claims that he makes today are equally unambiguous. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. He said, I am the true bread which comes down from heaven. Whoever believes in me shall never hunger. Whoever trusts in me shall never thirst. Those are unambiguous claims. And the question we have to ask is, what do we think of the Christ? What do you think of the Christ? You cannot be lukewarm about Jesus Christ. You cannot sit in the fence about Jesus Christ. His claims force a decision upon you. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he was a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us and he did not intend to. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, he presented the people with a choice. A decision had to be made, and that decision has to be made by you today. Let me tell you something. The decision you make for Jesus Christ is the most important decision you will ever make. It's more important than what career you will have, it's more important than the kind of house that you will buy. It is more important than the person you will marry. What you think of Jesus Christ will determine where you will spend eternity. That's the first thing that Palm Sunday teaches us, that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he claimed unambiguously to be the Savior of the world. But here's the second lesson that Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, teaches us that we need to keep in the forefront of our minds. It's that, yes, Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday claiming to be the Messiah, but he was claiming to be a Messiah who had come not to be lifted up upon a throne, but to be lifted up upon a cross. He had come to be the Messiah who would enter Jerusalem to die and to die voluntarily. You know, it's very easy to read through the gospel accounts of Holy Week and to think about the events of the succeeding days and come away with the impression that Jesus was really nothing more than an innocent victim of circumstances. When you think about all of the players in this drama, you sort of think that they're the ones that are really driving everything. You think, for example, about the crowds and how fickle they were, how quickly they changed from Hallelujah and Hosanna to crucify him, crucify him. You think about the animus of the Jewish religious leaders. The scribes and the Pharisees were always out there plotting Jesus' demise out of pure jealousy. You think about the duplicity of Pontius Pilate or the wickedness of Judas Iscariot. Or you think about the cowardice of the disciples themselves who deserted Jesus in his hour of need. And as I said, you almost come away with the impression that Jesus was just being carried along by circumstances that were beyond his control. That he was a young man who met a tragic end. Well, I want you to understand something. We must never look at Jesus' death as a mere tragedy. Now, don't get me wrong. Whenever a young person dies, it is always tragic. When Alexander the Great suddenly became ill and died at the age of 32, many people thought that was a tragedy. A great leader had been lost. When John Keats, the poet, died at 25 from tuberculosis, many people said that was a great tragedy. One of the great artists of the world had been lost. And many people think Jesus Christ, he died at the age of 33 at the hands of all these evil men. That is a great tragedy. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus' death was horrible. Jesus' death was terrible. But the one thing Jesus' death was not was accidental. When Jesus entered the city, he knew full well what was going to happen to him. He was under no illusions whatsoever. In fact, two days earlier, before he even got to the city... He had warned his disciples of this fact. 
In Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 32, we read these words, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve aside, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. That's two days before he ever gets to the city. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. Nobody forced his hand. And mind you, this was not just a revelation that came to him at the end, when all of a sudden he could see the storm clouds gathering on the horizon or the forces of evil mustering. No, Jesus knew that this was his mission in life. This is why he'd come into the world in the first place. This is why he had been born. There is a great painting that hangs in the City Museum in Manchester, England. Alan Runyon actually used it in the Rector's Forum today. You'll find a copy of it in the back of your bulletin. You'll want to turn to it while I walk you through it. It's a painting by the Victorian artist William Holman Hunt. Now, if you're familiar with the works of Hunt, the painting you're probably most familiar with is one called The Light of Christ, which hangs in St. Paul's Cathedral and shows Jesus knocking on the door of the heart. This is another painting by the same artist, and actually it's my favorite. It shows Jesus as a young man, about 30 years old, just before he has started his public ministry. He's working in Joseph's carpenter shop, and he has momentarily set aside his saw, and he is standing to stretch with his hands and arms extended above his head. As he does, the light from the open window casts a dark shadow on the wall behind him. On that wall is a toolkit. It appears as a horizontal bar, and it almost seems as though Jesus has been crucified on it. In the forefront of the painting, there is a woman kneeling down, opening a chest. That's his mother, Mary. And in that chest, you can see the gifts of the Magi, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Her demeanor indicates that she is absolutely horrified by the shadow that she sees. Now, as I said, the painting was done in the Victorian era, and it's typical of that time period. It's very sentimental, very romantic. Some people would say it's a little overdone. But I love it, not only for its artistic merit, but because of the theological point that it makes. The point that from the moment of his birth, when the Magi came from the East to worship him as a child, for the succeeding 33 years of his life, it was that dark shadow of the cross that loomed over Jesus' entire life, and he knew it. He said to his disciples, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again for this is the charge that I have received from my Father. Yes, it's true. At times, it appears as though other people were determining Jesus' fate. They certainly thought so. Pontius Pilate thought so. At one point in the trial, he turned to Jesus and he said, do you not know that I have the power to condemn you or the power to release you? And Jesus, who had been silent up to this point, suddenly spoke up, and he set the record straight. He said, I tell you the truth, you would have no power over me were it not given to you from above. I'm sure the disciples were absolutely shocked by how things turned out at the end of the week. I'm certain that they were absolutely appalled by how quickly the attitude of the people changed. But there was one person who was not the least bit surprised. For even as he rode through that golden gate, and even as the shouts and the cheers of the people were ringing in his ears, Jesus could see on the horizon that dark shadow of Calvary. That was his fate, and he embraced it, and he embraced it voluntarily. As the hymn that we just sang put it so well, ride on, ride on in majesty, ride on in lowly pomp to die. O Christ, thy triumphs now begin. 
or captive death and conquered sin. So Palm Sunday teaches us that Jesus entered the city claiming to be the Savior. It teaches us that he entered the city claiming to be the Savior who would die voluntarily. And finally, it teaches us that he is the Messiah who entered to die voluntarily because his death was necessary. This is a point that is made again and again in the Gospels. Following Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus said, the Son of Man must be handed over to the scribes and the Pharisees and suffer many things. In speaking to Nicodemus, Jesus said, the Son of Man must be lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. The Son of Man must suffer. The Son of Man must be lifted up. That word must implies necessity. And that's how Jesus' death is always presented to us in the New Testament, never as an option but as an absolute necessity. We've already seen that Jesus entered Jerusalem in a very very particular way. We said he entered on the back of a donkey to send a clear message to the crowds. Well, we should note that he not only entered the city in a particular way, he entered the city at a particular time. During the Passover. The Passover was the greatest feast of the Jews. It commemorated their liberation from slavery, their bondage in Egypt. You know the story. God had brought down a series of disastrous plagues on the Egyptians. And the worst plague, the most devastating, was the death of the firstborn son. God sent the angel of death through the land of Egypt, and he took the firstborn of every household, except the Israelite households. Because they had been told to slaughter a lamb and take the blood of that lamb and place it over the doorposts and the lentils of their house. And when the angel passed through the land and saw the blood of the lamb, he would pass over that house. Hence the term, Passover. When Jesus entered Jerusalem in the way that he did, at the time that he did, He was again sending a clear message to the people. And the message was that he had not come simply to commemorate or celebrate the Passover. He had come to be the Passover. He had come to be that spotless Lamb of God whose shed blood would deliver the people from their bondage, their bondage to sin and death. You understand that this is why the cross is the central symbol of the Christian faith? John Stott said that the early Christians could have chosen any symbol to represent their faith in Christ. They could have chosen, for example, the manger in which he was born, emblematic of his incarnation. They could have chosen the carpenter bench at which he labored in Joseph's house for all those years. They could have chosen the empty tomb, the symbol of his resurrection victory, or a golden throne, symbolic of his eternal kingdom. But no, the early Christians chose the symbol of his death. They chose the cross. The cross is in the front of our building. It's the cross on the top of our building. It's the cross that we wear around our necks. It's because there on the cross, Jesus paid in full the price for your sin and mine. It was there on the cross that he became our Paschal Lamb, our Passover Lamb, the full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. My favorite hymn of all time, which we will sing, and I pray sing with gusto in just a moment, gets it right. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. People will sometimes ask, Alan dealt with this this morning, 
They'll sometimes ask, well, couldn't God have saved us some other way? Listen, the answer to that is simple. There was no other way. As Alan did so well in his rector's form, he pointed out there was no other way for the justice of a holy, righteous, and pure God to be satisfied. And there was no other way to atone for the wicked rebellion and sin of humanity. For the wages of sin is death. There was no other good enough to pay the price for sin. He alone could unlock that door of heaven and let us in. When Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, brothers and sisters, he entered claiming to be the Messiah, the King of the world, the Savior of humanity. He entered that city for the purpose of giving his life and giving his life voluntarily. And he gave his life voluntarily because it was necessary. It was necessary to save you. It was necessary to save me. When he rode into that city, he was not well received by the people. Initially, yes, but in the end, they scorned and murdered the one who had come to save them. The question we have to ask ourselves this morning is this. As he comes again through the preaching of this word, Will he find in us a warmer welcome than he did so long ago? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we now begin this journey through Holy Week as we contemplate the things that our Lord endured for us and for our salvation. Grant us the grace to see what this week is really all about, to see him who claims to be our Messiah, to understand that he gave his life as a ransom for many, to understand that he gave it because it was necessary. Grant us the grace to hail him as our king and to enthrone him on our hearts this day. For it's in his name and for his sake that we pray. Amen.